This program is supported by South Carolina Humanities with the Federation of State and Territorial Humanities Councils through the Campfire Initiative, which was funded by grants from the Carnegie Corporation and the Mellon, Ford, and Knight Foundations to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Pulitzer Prizes in 2016. From the Jazz Age to the Digital Age, Pulitzer Prize winners in South Carolina. Celebrating Pulitzer Commentary with Kathleen Parker and Jim Hoagland. Hello and welcome to our program celebrating Pulitzer Commentary with Kathleen Parker and Jim Hoagland. I'm Charles Bierbauer. With me in the studios are two Washington Post columnists with South Carolina connections. Kathleen Parker's column is syndicated nationally in some 500 newspapers. And Jim Hoagland is a contributing editor for the Washington Post, writing on foreign affairs. Welcome to you both. Thanks for being here. It's good to have you with us. The Pulitzers, which we're celebrating, are in a variety of categories. We've talked with people in the arts in this series. We've talked with people doing daily and investigative reporting. Commentary is a different kind of beast in the sense that uh, you're not rushing out to things in the same way a journalist is. You've got a little bit of time to think about it. Let's talk a little bit about the craft. How do you go about putting together your 700 words twice a week? 750. 750. And I can write to the number pretty much every time. And those but, extra 50 words matter. Yeah, they oh, sure yeah. do. But what you said about um, it, it's a little different than what reporters do because they have to run out and cover breaking events. That's true, except that we were reporters first. And I think that's crucial to the way we approach column writing versus uh, so many people who have columns. You know, everybody is a columnist these days. And they have, column, they have columns, but they're not journalists writing columns. And I like to think of myself first as a journalist who, who does report and does have a reporter's eye for the news value, the quality of, of the, the subject several days hence. You know, you always have to decide, okay, today is, let's say it's Wednesday and, and maybe my column doesn't run for two or three days in print. I have to decide what's interesting to me and what will be interesting to other people and still be fresh several days later. And that's the biggest challenge for us now, I think, in this, in this uh, sped up, speeded up world of blogging and tweeting and whatnot. But yes, you do have time to think, and one should take time to think, and come up with something unique and to say about any given subject that isn't just, you know, you want people to read your column and say, gosh, I hadn't thought of it that way, or that's exactly what I think, but I just couldn't put it into words. How do you go about it? The writing what's, itself? What's, yes, what's your process? Because well, I want to hear Jim's. The writing and it is may the fun different. part. The writing is the fun part. You know, going through that process of figuring out what the topic should be and what it what it what it will be like in a couple of days or so. Um, that's the hardest part. And then I find research is is fun and interesting because you're learning something new. Ideally, if I'm just writing about what I think on a political topic, that may be a little bit different. Not so much reporting in that uh, area, <coughs> but. Um, so I sit down and, and once I get ready to write, um, it's an exciting moment for me. I, I love the writing part. And I write straight through all the way to the end. I don't pause for a punctuation. I don't correct myself. I don't get hung up on little details. Um, and then I, you know, I get to the end and I walk away from it. I always give myself some space. And if I have 10 minutes, I take those 10 minutes and, and do something else just to give myself a little distance between the, what I've written. Then I come back to it, and that's when I go back through and I clear out all the debris and I get rid of the dead wood and punctuate and correct spelling, all that sort of thing. And I do again, I walk away from it, and then I come back for my third sweep, which is when I insert what I call the art. That's an opportunity to sort of spice it up with some humor maybe if it didn't come out the first time, make sure that there's a, a sense of unity between the beginning and the ending, and, which is kind of a beautiful thing to me. <laughs> um, and you know, the simile or the metaphor is, is something you can ins install later if it's appropriate. So I, I do try to make it uh, a more interesting read than just, this is what I think. The, the 2010 Pulitzer citation noted that you write perceptive and often witty columns <laughs> on an array of political and moral issues. But you made the same point, adding some humor to it, adding some, yeah. some, some wit in that I sense. I wondered what they meant by often witty. <laughs> <laughs> Good example. <Yeah. laughs> Jim, I, what's, what's your approach? 
Well, I think everybody's is different. Mine couldn't be more different uh, from Kathleen's. In because the you're writing about, and let me again similarly cite 1991 Pulitzer searching and prescient columns uh, on events in that year leading up to the Gulf War and the political problems of Mikhail Gorbachev. That is rather different, isn't it? It is, but uh, stylistically I tend to uh, sweat over every sentence. Uh, although a, a great French political scientist and journalist, uh, Raymond Aron, once said, there are only two sentences that count in a, an op-ed piece. The first one, to get the reader into it, and the last one, to send the reader away with the message that you want that reader to have. And I think there's a lot to that. Um, I spent 20 years as a foreign correspondent for the Washington Post in which the Post paid me to keep my opinions out, by and large, uh, of the news. And then we decided it was time for me to begin to put my opinions in. And I had to sit down and figure out what it was I thought about different political subjects. And uh, so everybody has their own style and, and, and their own approach to it. But by and large, you have to have the intro, you have to have a therefore paragraph, you've laid out what the president is doing wrong in great detail in the first half of your piece, and ideally you come along with a therefore paragraph that says the president should now do these things. And I think that's the hardest part for people who've been reporters, is to come along and say, well, this is what should be done, <laughs> because we're trained not to do that. So you go through a transition process, but once you master that, it's a lot of fun. I, and I sense you would agree with Kathleen's point that being a reporter first prepares you for this, even, even if you've got to cross a Rubicon to move to, to some other side of, of, of shaping things. Well, it prepares you to write a certain kind of column, which is a column that includes a lot of reporting. We have colleagues who don't subscribe to that theory, who wing it, um, and who preach a good bit in their columns. I don't think either of us particularly subscribe to doing that. We want to get people to thinking about the issue, maybe come to their own conclusions rather than taking the conclusion that uh, you think they should have, but at least to make them approach the issue on the basis that you approach the issue on. Yeah. How, how well, the you, objective is to, be, is to convince people to think about something in a different way. And um, the preaching finger-wagging approach doesn't work in life or in columns, I think. Um, so what I typically do, I mean, my, I have an attitude about my readers, which is that we're friends. And so I'm, I'm having a conversation with them and I, I, lie, I lay out what I think and what I've observed and what I've found to be true and I use facts to support my opinions so they don't think I just went in and, you know, you know powdered my nose and came up with, well, this is, this is what you should think. And I guide them, and I bring them along with me. It's kind of a, 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 an exercise of discovery. And I consider them my cohorts in this. And um, at the end of it, I'd like for them to say, as I said before, um, well, yeah, <laughs> I think that too. <laughs> you know, it doesn't always happen. Well, it's just they, they could just as well say, oh, swell, but that's your opinion. Yes, they do, how often. Much, how much except they don't say swell. <laughs> <laughs> how much feedback do you get from readers? less than I used to, and, and that's because people can now go online and post their horrible thoughts <laughs> <laughs> anonymously, um, and so they're less often inclined to get to go to me directly, because that would involve a, a human exchange of sorts, and it's much easier for them to be nasty uh, when, you're no longer, when you're not a human, but you're just this, this voice out there that they don't like for whatever reason, and I, should, I wish that they would learn that I don't ever read those comments. You know, I, I guess it helps them to vent their spleen, but um, the nicer people will write me directly, but the nasties are all online doing their thing. Feedback? Yes, it depends a lot on the subjects you write about. If I write a column about the Middle East, I'm gonna get feedback, and how. Um, everybody seems to have their own opinion about the Middle East, uh, and yours is always wrong, whatever you say. Mm -hmm. uh, if I write more about European integration, uh, I'll get a lot less feedback. Uh, on that. So a lot of it is the topic and, and a lot of it is the way you present it. True. I've noticed that in uh, writing in the internet age, um, it's quite different than writing a column uh, for the newspaper, for a print newspaper. I used to visualize sentences as I went along and try to get each sentence balanced right and to 
come out with a, uh, a perspective on things. When you write for the internet, there is an urgency, and you become inevitably a little more polemical, or maybe a lot more polemical, in your column writing, in your editorial writing. And uh, that's what's happened to the, to the industry today. But aren't, aren't, aren't you, when you're writing, is the same content going both in the paper and, and on the internet? I presume it is. Yes, yes. So you're but, adding. But we you're also write things uh, for the internet alone. Solely. And that's what's different. Does a good column get both praise and criticism, Jim? Can it can? I mean, there are very intelligent critics out there uh, who you can engage. I've had uh, extended dialogues with some of my critics uh, without them changing my mind or my changing theirs necessarily. Um, so you do you get some, but most of it is not that helpful, as Kathleen mm -hmm. has suggested. Most of it is griping that you don't believe the same thing that person does. But I should say, you know, I do have some readers who have, with whom I've corresponded for years and years. And these, are, these t tend to be extremely intelligent people who really do care about the way the world's going and want to have this a conversation. And I, I, don't, I can't do that with everyone, but the people who are particularly um, challenging or interesting or have s some expertise, I mean, I've got a lot of uh, two or three who are really knowledgeable people who've been around for a long time done a lot of important work, and I love those conversations, you know, and they are dear friends of mine, even though we've never met. Does that influence your further writing? It does. Yeah, was, uh, yeah absolutely. Do, I do learn from them, you know. Do you take suggestions on, on columns? You ought to write something about this. Uh, something yes, about I do, actually. <laughs> That's interesting, because yeah. I find the hardest thing to do is to try to write somebody else's idea. Well, it's, it's not, very you're not writing their idea, but if they get you thinking about something in a way perhaps you hadn't considered before, or they add some new dimension, to a subject, um, then I think, then that gets you going. It's like any conversation you have with anyone, but pr you prefer to have conversations with smart people, right? Right. But, but you learn, it, things come up, things bubble up in your mind that can later be useful uh, toward the, you know, the germination of an idea or. So you're writing little post-it notes and stickies well, and I, things like that? Well, I scribble like notes all the time. If we talk on the phone, I will have recorded it, but it's just a habit, so. I, I think one of the important things about having been a reporter is that you've spent time going around and talking to the people who are making the news. And you've been able to form judgments of them and of their ideas and their policies. So that's your value added. Uh, that's why I write about the Middle East, I write about Africa, I write uh, about Russia and China, uh, places that I've lived and studied. Uh, I rarely write about Latin America because I have no practical experience there as a reporter. So I think that value added for a columnist comes from your life experiences, from your professional experiences, and from your thinking about them and trying to extract the essential meaning. Mm -hmm. How hard is it to be <coughs> spot on twice a week? Well, I never, ex I never try to be spot on. I mean, no, I shouldn't say it that way. Um, I'm trying to be humble here. Um, because I am spot on twice a week, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm usually, uh, <laughs> it's hard, it's always we, hard. We can move on from it's always hard. It. To, it's <laughs> always hard to write a column. I just, no matter how many times I've done it, and I've got about 3,000 under my belt, and you do too, because you started, we started writing columns uh, about the same time. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it never gets easier because you're constantly raising the bar on yourself. You want to write a better column, you want to write a better sentence. You want to have a, a point of view that does make a difference. Sometimes you want to just have fun, but most of the time you're trying to trying to add something to the conversation. So mm -hmm. it's it's hard. The the pleasure of writing twice a week, despite all the deadline pressure, is that you have a chance to come back to the subject, and in fact you have a need to come back. 750 words, you can express basically one idea. If you want to express one and a half ideas, you're going to need a thousand words and two ideas, you're gonna need 1,400. In 750 words, you can express one idea, but you can't say all that you need to say. So the fact that you can come back and on the same subject and add to it and expand on it a little bit is a tremendous advantage. When you're only writing once a week or once a month, it's much tougher, actually. Yeah, I don't think you're as sharp if you only write once a week. It's mm -hmm. twice a week just keeps you, you're, you know, you're going at such a intense, 
rate there's of... A, there's a rhythm to it's, it? It's mm -hmm. not, yes, there's mm -hmm. a rhythm to it, and it's also, you know, you have to stay attuned. You can't just t give your mind a break. You have to constantly be aware of what's going on and, and read and talk to people and be on. You're, on. you're saying this in the age of Twitter, and, <laughs> and, and Jim has alluded to that in terms of writing online and, and how that has a, a, a different impact or a different character to it, uh, and and yet people are trying to say something in 140 characters. Do you tweet? I do. I don't tweet a lot. I, st I opened a Twitter account so that I could write about it. <clears throat> and then I didn't tweet for several more years, and I never had any followers. And I realized, oh, you have to tweet to get followers. So I started doing it. You know, there's pressure on us to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very hard for someone like me, and I'm sure for Jim, who, who, we just, you know, we don't, we're not the sort of people who tweet comfortably. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not Speak a word that I even Do you want tweet to use. Um, I, I, I actually, uh, essentially, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's hard, um, and I find it distracting. Uh, I'll tell you one thing. I've started doing though. I've noticed that in the in this world of, you know, constant, constant, constant production, that I'm beginning to say, oh my gosh, does a comma go there? And I've been I've always been such a grammatical, you know, tyrant because I want to. I was raised that way, so you know we were beaten but for using that, improper. That's a character. Grammar. If you use that comma, <laughs> a comma, you can save a character by. by yes, omitting that's a whole it. character. But yeah. I've decided I'm yeah. not going to give up. I'm going to punctuate, even if I have to say less. Good. <laughs> I, I punctuate and edit my tweets. I think it's. There you go. I think it's essential. Um, and, um, let's talk a little bit about content. We talked a lot about craft here. Uh, uh, <coughs> what are the kinds of stories? that make you sit up and say, I really want to write this story? Let me ask Jim first. Yeah. Well, I think it's the old uh, news person's reflex, uh, finding out something that nobody else knows or that hasn't been published yet, the, the news value. Now, that goes against the grain of commentary, of course, but uh, I'm always, you ask me what really turns me on in terms of writing a column, it is having access to an important fact that you can not only reveal, as a reporter does, but put into a different kind of context and into a different uh, perspective. So that's one of the great things about it. Uh, I that, and that's one of the reasons I still continue to go out and report all the time, even though it doesn't make its way into all my columns. I would say the best columnists do a lot of reporting. Um, and our editor, Alan Shearer at the Syndicate, says, you know, every column should have one new thing in it, at least one thing that nobody else knows or has thought about. Um, so that's always a challenge. And, um, you know, as to what I, I, I'm focused on primarily politics mm -hmm. these days because that's what we're in the midst of. <coughs> but I like to try to take things to a, a slightly different level of, you know, what does this mean in a larger sort of historical context, sociological, philosophical, whatever, some other way of looking at it other than just who's up and who's down. That doesn't interest me very much. And once this political season is over, you know, then you focus on what is actually happening in Washington that people need to know about in terms of how their life is going to be uh, affected by policies and such. But for me personally, if I were to choose a beat, a new beat, it would be bioethics. Hmm. I think that the, the big decisions we'll be making as a, as, as, as a human race in the next, uh, the next generation going forward are going to be the most interesting and the most problematical of all because we're going to be dealing with, with robots. We're going to be dealing with the dehumanization of workplaces through auto even increased automation. And you know, we're going to have to really decide what human life needs to be and, and, and how we want to how we want to fashion a world in the future. To me, those are the most interesting and compelling topics. Kathleen's answer reminds me that the other big thrill is the thrill of seeing a pattern, seeing something big historically happening and coming to that conclusion before anybody else. So there's also the discovery element as well as the reporting element. We are, as you note, in a political season. And as we sit here, we don't know what's going on out there that, that could make everything we, we're about to say already dated. Yeah. Uh, and yet we're, we're, we feel, as, as journalists, as, as, as commentators, as columnists, almost driven to report this extraordinary political season. Uh, what about the political season do you find 
compelling, disturbing? <clears throat> well, I've, I've been covering politics since the late, well, I was a, had a political column at the Charleston newspaper in, the, in 1980 leading up to the very first Republican primary. So I've been watching politics for a long time and seeing it change, but the, there's a difference in this season than anything I've ever witnessed or imagined. And it has to do with, um, well, I mean, it's the, the, the person we're talking about, of course, is Donald Trump, but, but the, what he is going after in, in the public is, is this, everybody talks about the anger, and, the, and I, I think a lot of people would have a hard time explaining exactly what they're so angry about. You wrote a column a little while ago that, that pretty much compared a Trump rally to a Hitler rally. Well, you know, I, um, I actually wrote a column a long time ago that said I would never use Hitler in a column because I think it devalues the, the whole, what happened during that period and in, in the experience of those who died in the Holocaust, that it was just, it was too, you know, it was just too grave an event mm -hmm. to borrow from. And then I broke my own rule and I mentioned Hitler in this column. And the reason was because I'd been talking to, well, I've been talking to a lot of my Jewish friends and they are hearing the language of fascism and they are hearing the, the language that their parents, some of whom were survivors of the concentration camps, in the language and in the tenor of the, of the language that, that Donald Trump has used. Um, you know, do I think when he raised, when he had everybody raise their hand to pledge their allegiance to him, do I think he was trying to evoke, uh, you know, a, a Hitler rally? No, I don't, but I do hear that the speech was much better in the original German. <laughs> Um, <laughs> there's just too much of it. It's too much. It's mean-spirited. It's angry. It's demoniz demonizing groups of people, and that's what Hitler did do. Uh, you know, when you're having bad economic times, well, it's this person's fault, or it's the Muslims, or it's the, it's the Mexicans, or, or whatever, and that's exactly what Hitler did. So it is, it's important, I think, for us to be cognizant of you know, we have a balance uh, of power in this country, and we have, we're, we're set up to manage these things. But it's still out there, and it's a very negative thing to have a person who's willing to go to those levels of, of um, demonization, dehumanization, and a time, and, and a time like as, uh, as today when we're sort of embracing a more global view of things and trying to understand rather than partition you know, the various demographics and cultures. And in, in that sense of a global, vil, uh, global view, Jim, you and I were chatting about this earlier, how, how people in other countries are reacting to Trump. Um, most of my friends overseas are horrified uh, by the prospect of an American president who would encourage nuclear proliferation in Japan or South Korea. Um, and um, they're puzzled, and they constantly send me emails and letters asking, what is going on? And I struggle to try to answer. And part of the answer is something Kathleen referred to, um, is the reaction, I would put it even more strongly, the backlash we are seeing today that Trump represents to globalization, to the idea that was very uh, popular, and very uh, accepted uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that national borders are disappearing. And now we have a campaign that's based on suspicion, if not outright resentment and hatred of things foreign. Uh, Trump preaches basically that uh, globalization, the, the effects of globalization trade have produced a destitute United States that cannot afford to have forces abroad. Even those, those forces have basically played the role of honest broker and stabilizing uh, forces. But we, we, we also have a Europe that uni that's sort of unified and now is rethinking that in and of itself, whether erasing all those borders was such a good idea. Well, they've grown to 28 members from six originally. 12 was a good functioning number. It's, it's unwieldy. Uh, integration has essentially come to a halt in Europe because you have in Europe the same reaction. You have countries that are saying we now have to close our borders to things that are foreign. Um, I think eventually Europe will work its way through that uh, if they can get a handle on the refugee crisis in particular. Uh, but it's an uneasy time in Europe as well as in the United States for many of the same reasons.
We, we've got just <coughs> under two minutes left for this. It seems like we ought to have a few more hours to discuss this. But since we're talking about writing, we're talking about the craft and the Pulitzers, who's, who's in your pantheon of writers? Whom do you admire? Jim first. Uh, well, I guess um, at the beginning, um, well, you've got to read Walter Lippmann and the history of journalism. Uh, Walter Lippmann used to write five columns a week, by the way. Uh, but uh, James Reston was one of my heroes as a journalist. Uh, today, uh, you have very good columnists uh, like David Brooks um, and many at the Washington Post. Um, these are, you know, really we'll outstanding. We'll plug for the Washington Post yeah. there. Kathleen? Well, we do have an awfully good stable of, of writers at the Post. Well, I grew up reading and, and loving Russell Baker. He was just my all-time favorite. And I'd like to think I might have learned something from him. And of course, H.L. Mencken is, is, he created the column essentially. And, uh, you know, he turned us all into amateur, amateur curmudgeons. <laughs> um, but um, I guess, and, and then today, you know, I, I have to confess, I don't read many columnists. I don't want to be influenced by them. I don't want to, and I, more or less, they're, Mostly, they're kind of friends now, and I, I kind of know what they think. <laughs> you know? Well, I do read them, and I enjoy reading Kathleen Parker and Jim Hogan, and I'm very pleased to have you with us. Thanks, both of you, for being here. Thank, Thank you so much. This program is supported by South Carolina Humanities with the Federation of State and Territorial Humanities Councils through the Campfire Initiative, which was funded by grants from the Carnegie Corporation and the Mellon, Ford, and Knight Foundations to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Pulitzer Prizes in 2016.